Hey y'all, we're gonna get started with muscle contraction. And before we go any further, let me just kind of go over this neurovascular junction paper one more time. Uh, some of y'all sent me some questions on Remind about the diagram that you have to fill in for homework. And I wanna use the diagram that we did earlier to fill in the rest of this muscle cell. Okay, so at the bottom here is the muscle cell, it's the muscle fiber, and it still has everything in it that the muscle fiber had on the other diagrams. It's just that we've only drawn the sarcolemma and the T-tubule. So you should expect to have a sarcoplasmic reticulum inside this cell, and that sarcoplasmic reticulum is going to store calcium. And the specialized area of this sarcoplasmic reticulum that is close to the T-tubule is actually the terminal cisternae. So remember when we did the notes the other day, I told you that a cistern is something that holds something. It's a storage container. And so on either side of this T-tubule, you will have two terminal cisternae. Those two terminal cisternae and one T-tubule make up a triad. We labeled that on our notes that a triad is two terminal cisternae plus one T-tubule. And the purpose again of that terminal cisternae is to store calcium. So not only do you have calcium up here in the synaptic knob, you've got calcium down here in this terminal cisternae waiting to be used. And in the muscle contraction notes that we're going to do today, um, you'll see why this calcium is as important down here as it was up here. Okay, so anything orange on this paper is going to refer to calcium. Okay, so again, that terminal cisternae stores calcium. It is a part of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and they are on either side of a T-tubule. Uh, what else did y'all have questions about? I think the motor end plate uh, was an issue. It's just a bracketed area, a specialized area of that sarcolemma where the motor neuron is going to connect to the muscle fiber. Also within this muscle fiber, you've got all the sarcomere stuff. Okay, the sarcomere is not just an arbitrary part. I mean, it's very concentrated inside of that muscle fiber. So along with those terminal cisternes of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, you would have your sarcomere. That's going to run from Z disc to Z disc or Z line to Z line. You're going to have actin attached to it. You're going to have myosin kind of situated here in the center. And that's going to cause the actual muscle contraction. So again, this part of this diagram is a very simplistic picture of, let me get to it, of, oh, come on, this. Okay, this is a very simplistic picture of a muscle fiber, which is made of myofibrils, which is, has uh, actin and myosin in it, which has a sarcoplasmic reticulum on top of that. Two terminal cisternae on either side of that sarcoplasmic reticulum. T-tubule down the center. That T-tubule is just a hole in the sarcolemma. So even though this doesn't look exactly like the other one, it's still the same image. It's still a muscle fiber, and you can't forget about everything else that goes into it, or you really can't think about it as two different topics because in the next set of notes that we're going to do, we're going to zoom into this muscle fiber and go way into a myofibril, look at that structure of actin, look at that structure of myosin, and you have to visualize this process happening uh, in your head. All right, so that kind of gets you through the worksheet that I think people were struggling with um, that you have to submit. Let me pull one out of my pile. Um, if you look at it, the questions that I think were most confusing were 12, 13, and 14. Okay, so 12 is a T-tubule, and I know that because if I follow my finger along this motor end plate, it's going to dip down. That, that sarcolemma is going to have a full opening to it. 
And this open area is the T tubule. And on either side of that is the terminal cisternae of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And its purpose, again, is to store calcium because later we'll learn that, that calcium is going to come out. And it's going to come talk to and really work on this sarcomere that you see in the center of this muscle fiber. There's millions of sarcomeres in just one bicep muscle. And so the calcium is going to come out and go bind to um, troponin, which is on actin. And then that's going to cause a whole kind of shift in the actin and myosin binding and allow for the sarcomere to shorten. If you remember from, oh, it was Thursday or Friday, we talked about the sarcomere and how it's like you hold on to this Z, Z line and you push it in to cause a contraction and you squeeze it back out. We're, we're closing this H zone here in the center. We're closing the curtain and opening the curtain. Okay, and so what I'll do now is I'll go over a review of sarcomere before we do muscle contraction notes just to kind of freshen our minds of sarcomere since it's been a couple days. Um, okay. We look at sarcomere back to the other day. Uh, let's go over some important regions of this sarcomere. Remember, a sarcomere is a contractile unit of a muscle cell. It is the contractile piece, and it is located on a myofibril. So one sarcomere is just one section of this myofibril. Now multiply that times a lot and then put all those myofibrils into one cell and think about how many cells make up a muscle. And so sarcomeres are in the millions when it comes to an entire muscle. In that sarcomere, remember we had two Z lines. Those Z lines are going to be the, the borders or the perimeter of that sarcomere. Actin will attach directly to the Z-line. Myosin doesn't. Myosin is going to be suspended here in the center of the sarcomere, and it does not move during contraction. It stays still, and these little heads, these little golf club flipper-looking things on the myosin are going to bind to actin and pull on them. If we go and think about ways that that myosin can stay still, how do you anchor it into the center of this sarcomere and hold it still? Well, you have an M line down the middle and you have Titan, which is going to tie that myosin onto the Z disc or Z line. Uh, if we go back to the banding pattern, remember that I band is only composed of actin. A band is the area where it is actin and myosin. The H zone and the M line tend to be the most confusing. Okay, the H zone is this whole center region. Okay, if I were to draw a big old bracket around the whole thing, think about that being a box down the center of the sarcomere. The H zone is just myosin, and a specific part of the H zone is called the M line. And that is where uh, myosin is bound to another protein, which holds it in place in the center. So two ways to anchor that myosin, tighten on the edges and M line in the center. And actin doesn't need to be uh, anchored because it attaches to the Z line directly. Okay, And it's small uh, in comparison to that myosin. All right, and finally, we'll look at um, the structure of actin versus the structure of myosin. When we do this muscle contraction notes, we're going to talk a lot about tropomyosin and troponin. So let's go back and look at actin one more time. Actin is a double-stranded set of beads. So it's like you take beads on a string and you twist them together. The specific sites on actin that are complementary to myosin are called myosin binding sites. And they are covered up when the muscle is relaxed. They are covered up by a blanket called tropomyosin. It is this orange blanket that you see here. On the blanket is another molecule called troponin. Okay, And troponin and tropomyosin together form something called the troponin-tropomyosin complex. It just means that they're bound together. 
when we get to the end of muscle contraction and we're, we're about ready to contract, the calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, specifically the terminal cisternae, are going to come and bind to this troponin. When they bind to troponin, it is going to cause the tropomyosin troponin complex to move out of the way so that the myosin binding sites on actin are free and the myosin and actin can finally bind together and uh, form that muscle contraction that is the end goal. Okay, so what we'll do now is go to the muscle contraction notes that you picked up. It's kind of a big packet. Uh, we'll go through each individual step. It's like 16 steps of contraction and relaxation, and we will take it pretty slow. Okay, here we go. So this picture shows you all the way back to the neuromuscular junction, and you really can't leave that part out because if the neuron doesn't tell the muscle to contract, then it won't. Okay, if, the, if red light never changes to green, then you're not going to go anywhere. And remember, that neuron is going to turn that light green. We haven't pressed the gas pedal, but it is going to stimulate that muscle to contract. When you stimulate a muscle to contract, it's called an action potential. You have the potential to do some action. You have the potential to contract in this case. And this is everything kind of in one big picture to show you that it's really not separate steps. Everything, once you get... You know, inside that muscle cell is localized to the muscle cell. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is there. The terminal cisternae is there. Actin's there. Myosin's there. Because all of that is found within the sarcolemma. The first four steps are going to go through neuromuscular junction review. Okay, you start with the nerve impulse. It arrives at the axon terminal. That axon terminal is another name for the synaptic knob. Okay, those, those terms are interchangeable. The nerve impulse arrives at the synaptic knob, which will cause voltage-gated calcium channels to open. So these are voltage-gated. Rem remember to the lecture from earlier, voltage-gated means that it's a lightning bolt. It is a voltage change, an ionic concentration change, which causes the door to open. There's going to be two different kinds of gates that we'll talk about, voltage-gated and ligand-gated. Voltage-gated means that the voltage, the electricity, changes the door. It opens the door for calcium to come in. Ligand-gated channels are going to open when something binds to it. You have to bind a chemical to the door in order to open it, not just a zap of, of a voltage. So again, nerve impulse comes down from the brain or spinal cord, reaches the synaptic knob. When that voltage reaches the synaptic knob, it's going to cause calcium voltage-gated channels to open. Calcium is in a higher concentration outside the synaptic knob than in, so it's going to rush down its concentration gradient and into the synaptic knob. Once it, the calcium rushes into the synaptic knob, that signals the synaptic vesicles to move to the end of the axon terminal. It is not that calcium pushes it. Okay, there's another whole series of events that occur where you know, it kind of turns on the vesicle, which causes it to drive down to the end of the synaptic knob. Okay, just know that that calcium is the signal for synaptic vesicles to move to the end of the axon terminal or the synaptic knob they will fuse with that um, axon terminal and release acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft, add this in, by exocytosis. Okay, the process of the acetylcholine releasing itself from that synaptic vesicle is called exocytosis. The synaptic knob literally spits it out. It's going to spit it out, and it's going to be in a high concentration right here and a low concentration on the other side of the cleft. And so it does what it normally does. Everything's going to diffuse. Everything likes to go from high concentration to low concentration. So acetylcholine is going to diffuse across the cleft, and when it diffuses across the cleft, it will bind to ligand-gated sodium channels. 
So these pink channels that you see on this page here are ligand gated sodium channels. What does that mean? In order for the door to open, in order for this channel to allow sodium to rush in, acetylcholine has to bind. If acetylcholine does not bind, the gate won't open and sodium ru won't rush in. Okay, the rushing of that sodium through the ligand-gated sodium channels causes the green light. So if we stop that process and sodium doesn't rush in, then that light stays red or it goes from green to red. Okay, so let me talk about that one more time. Synaptic vesicles fuse with the end of the synaptic knob. They release acetylcholine by exocytosis. Acetylcholine moves across the cleft, diffuses across the space or the cleft between the motor neuron and the muscle fiber. They will bind to receptors on that motor end plate, which causes those receptors to open. Those receptors are ligand-gated sodium channels. When they open, sodium, which is always there, okay, it's just naturally occurring in that cleft, Sodium goes from a high concentration to a low concentration. It will rush into the cell, rush into the muscle cell through the ligand-gated sodium channels. Okay, now once it goes through those sodium channels and once the sodium rushes in, an action potential is generated. An action potential is localized. Okay, and what I mean by that is it, it's pretty stuck where this motor end plate is. But it is also a domino effect, meaning that if we have an action potential at the motor end plate, it is going to spread down the entire sarcolemma. So we're just kind of knocking down one domino at the motor end plate, and that's going to spread that message, spread the action potential down the rest of the sarcolemma until we reach a T-tubule. Okay, the continuation of an action potential down the sarcolemma is called a muscle impulse. Okay, so an action potential is a one-time deal. Okay, it happens at the motor end plate, and when it does, if it is enough of an action potential, it will spread down the sarcolemma and turn into a muscle impulse. So they are two different things. One is localized, and then a muscle impulse is more widespread, traveling down that sarcolemma. Since the action potential is going down the sarcolemma, so right here where you see the synaptic knob, that's where the action potential is generated because the sodium rushes in. But once that sodium rushes in, it causes that action potential to be propagated or moved down that sarcolemma. Well, eventually that sarcolemma is going to dip down. And this opening that you see right here is called the T-tubule. That's no different than the T-tubule we've been labeling the whole entire unit. Okay, so the sarcolemma, sarcolemma was going to dip down, and it's, it's still cell membrane. So if the action potential is spreading down the cell membrane and becoming an impulse, it's just going to dip down with that T-tubule. Okay, so muscle impulse travels down. Action potential right here turns into a muscle impulse, travels down, dips down that T-tubule, and, and what will happen next is all due to the anatomy of the muscle cell. If the T-tubule is right here, and that's where that muscle impulse is traveling, that's good because right next door on either side, you've got the terminal cisternae. You've got a storage center of calcium. So step seven, the muscle impulse travels down the T-tubule. Okay, so that's a little bit redundant. We know that. Action potential is generated over here on the motor end plate zooms down the sarcolemma, dips down that T-tubule. Because the T-tubule is right next door, 
to the terminal cisternae, that impulse is the same thing as the voltage that happened a long time ago. Okay, that happened way up in the synaptic knob. So a voltage-gated calcium channel again is going to open. It's just now that voltage-gated calcium channel is on the terminal cisternae. It's not all the way back up in the synaptic knob. We're done with that. Okay, so voltage-gated calcium channels open. That calcium is really highly concentrated inside this terminal cisternae. So what's it going to do? It's going to come out. And where is it going to go? Okay, it is going to go into the sarcoplasm. The sarcoplasm is the cytoplasm. Yo, it can't leave the cell. We're, we're inside the cell. So it's just going to come out of the organelle and into la-la land, into the space of that muscle cell. What else is in that muscle cell? You've got a myofibril. On that myofibril is actin and myosin. Actin and myosin are organized in sarcomeres. Okay, so you really got to know the anatomy of the muscle before this can even make sense. Okay, the, there's no way for the calcium to just leak out of the cell. Once the calcium gates open, let me go back one. Once the calcium gates open in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, you're inside the cell. Calcium is going to just spill out into the space of the cell around those myofibrils and around the actin and myosin so that it can do its job. That calcium is going to bind to troponin. Okay, so now you have to zoom in again in your head to the structure of actin. In the back of your mind, you can always see that sarcomere. Okay, and that sarcomere is made of actin and myosin. But specifically, actin is covered by tropomyosin. On that tropomyosin is troponin. Okay, so if we look here, the green is, tropo, uh, is tropomyosin and the blue is troponin. Calcium's floating and it says, ooh, I like this. I am complementary to this troponin. Let me bind here. And so when the calcium binds to troponin, it's going to move the blanket out of the way. The blanket is going to shift. Okay, that is a conformational change. Tropomyosin moves out of the way. And that's great because now... Myosin binding sites on actin are ready. They are now exposed. Before, they've been covered by tropomyosin. But calcium bound, it came into the sarcoplasm, so it bound to the troponin, which moved that tropomyosin out of the way. And now all of these active sites, these myosin binding sites on actin are ready to go. Myosin takes that opportunity and says, well, if tropomyosin's not there anymore, let me bind. And so the myosin head or the golf club flipper is going to bind to the myosin binding site on actin. Okay, they have complementary sites. There's a little, you know, area on this myosin head that matches the other little spot on the actin. So actin has a spot for myosin. Myosin has a spot for actin. They click together like Legos, but we still haven't contracted. Okay, we are just kind of getting ready for contraction. The light's been green, but it's like you got to put your foot on the pedal and then you, you got to press the pedal and you're like, oh my gosh, are we ever going to go anywhere? Okay, so the contraction itself still hasn't occurred. When the actin and myosin bind together, it's going to form something called a cross bridge. Okay, I don't know where the derivation of that comes, but that's what it's called. Okay, so when they click together, it is called a cross bridge. Finally, with the help of ATP. Okay, we haven't talked about the mitochondria other than just labeling it, but it is important. A purpose of the mitochondria is not just to be the powerhouse of the cell. Okay, what does that mean? It means that it undergoes cellular respiration to make us lots of ATP. And so that ATP is going to be used to contract the muscle. That contraction is going to come from actin and myosin binding 
But then the myosin head is going to flex. It's going to pull on actin. Remember, we're going to close the curtain of the H zone and open it back up. Myosin stays still. So its little flipper heads are going to like walk themselves down the actin. And every single time they flex and they pull and pull and pull on that actin until we fully close the curtain. And then in the second, we're going to see, well, how do we undo? How do we open that curtain back up or relax the muscle? Okay, I've drawn a little uh, magic wand here of ATP. So you can see this is one of the steps of muscle contraction that form, that, that require, rather, ATP. Okay, at this point, the muscle is contracted and the sarcomere shortens. Okay, so at the end of contraction... The sarcomere is shortened, meaning that the H zone disappears. A band remains roughly the same. I bands get more narrow. The entire sarcomere shortens. So go back to this from the other day. Here, we're fully relaxed. Here, we're down at the bottom. We're fully contracted. What is the difference in the banding patterns on that sarcomere when it's contracted versus relaxed? Okay, so at the end of this, we're done contracting. And now you have to ask yourself, well, how do I undo this? How, we, we've done 12 steps and we've contracted a muscle, but every single time a muscle contracts, the antagonist or the opposite muscle has to be relaxed. And so in order to do that, in my head, I think about what steps caused that contraction. Well, the first one was the acetylcholine. Okay, the acetylcholine binds to the ligand-gated sodium channels, and when the sodium rushes in, we got a green light. Okay, that's step one. Step two, actin and myosin bound together, and we did the power stroke. Okay, that power stroke is the flexion of that myosin head. So if I'm going to undo any two things to relax the muscle, I need to undo way up the line. Because if I don't have sodium, I don't have a green light, then we're relaxed. The light remains red. Okay, or we're going back from green to red. So if we undo this acetylcholine, that's step one. And then once that happens, we're going to undo the binding of actin and myosin together. Okay, so the way to undo it is by a big old enzyme. Okay, and an enzyme is going to break down acetylcholine. The specific name for the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine is called acetylcholine esterase. Okay, a, a whole mouthful. If you see the stem ASE, okay, the suffix ASE on a word, it generally means it's an enzyme. In this case, acetylcholine esterase breaks down acetylcholine. So if I break it down, if I use an enzyme and chop it up like a big pair of scissors, it's going to unbind from the ligand-gated sodium channel. So that door closes. Sodium cannot rush in. So I can't have an action potential that's turned into a muscle impulse. So the light goes back to red. If you continue to rush that sodium in, well, of course the muscle is going to contract. But if we stop that, then again, we stop the contraction way far up in the process. Second step is, I'm going to unbind actin and myosin from one another. The way to do that is put the blanket back where it goes. Well, how did we move the blanket to begin with? We moved the blanket, tropomyosin, by the binding of sodium, uh, not sodium, by the binding of calcium, to troponin. So pull it off. Take the calcium off of troponin. Then that's going to put the blanket back over the sites on actin so the actin and myosin can't click together anymore. Okay, the only tricky part is you've got to have ATP to unbind it and put it back where it goes. Okay, so you're going to use ATP to put the calcium back into the terminal cisternae. Okay, and because you're going against the concentration gradient, you have to require ATP. 
We're going from a high concentration to a low concentration, now a low concentration to a high concentration. So ATP is required to actively transport calcium back into the terminal cisternate. We're just putting it back right here. Okay, it did float out into the sarcoplasm. Now it's got to go back. Okay, the reason that it's got to go back is because we've got to put tropomyosin back where it goes. So the actin and myosin cannot remain bound and the muscle will not remain contracted or it will be relaxed. Now, once that calcium is back in the cisternae, actin's active sites or their myosin binding sites are covered up by tropomyosin. Blanket shifts back. Everybody's happy. Back to resting where we were to begin with. Sarcomere slides back to its resting state. Curtain reopens. And now we're ready to do this again should we get another message from the brain. Okay, and later we'll talk about, you know, what does that mean? How, how can you continually contract? What's a cramp? What's a muscle spasm? What happens when you die with rigor mortis? I mean, there's all kinds of what ifs uh, when it comes to muscle contraction. But the step by step by step process is what you need to get under your belt right now. And I know it's hard to visualize. I know it's abstract. But, you know, I kind of see it like a little cartoon happening in my head and then I always think well how, why what what if acetylcholine didn't bind or what would it mean if I didn't have enough sodium or what is sodium for again like start to question you know what process can we or what step can we stop um, to cause muscle relaxation or cause muscle contraction and it happens so fast Okay, so fast on either side of it to relax and contract um, and vice versa. All right, so your practice for this is an ordering sheet that you'll put online. I think there's also, um, let's see here, muscle contraction ordering sheet. Yes, so that will be due, uh, I think it's on the 18th by midnight. So I'm trying to give you all a little bit of time to get acquainted with this e-learning process and then the next lecture which will be on Wednesday is energy sources so how are we getting ATP and where is that coming from and the, the mitochondria of course makes it but where is that source um, in your body for glucose um, okay so the, again your homework is just an ordering sheet and then I'm going to try to figure out how to get a quiz online so that I can quiz y'all on sarcomere structure and the neuromuscular junction. And I'll be sending that out uh, by text message with instructions once I get uh, up and going on that. All right. Thanks, guys.